Hey guys, welcome back to the Autonomy Pod podcast. I'm really, really excited to have two guests on with me today, Nathan and Natalie. And we're just going to talk about their stories, their journeys of how they got into the industry and just have some good old chat about uh, the fitness and nutrition and what they specialize in. So, hey guys, welcome to the podcast. Hello, hello. We're so happy to be here. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, because actually I was on uh, your podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago, which was really, really enjoyed. We had a really nice chat. So, you know, why not? We we were thinking about just, you know, me and Nathan were sitting there going, oh, we could chat for ages. So I was like, well, why don't you just come on and do one with us anyway? So, um, you know, we're here now. So what? where are you guys based, just for the listeners? And then what do you guys really specialize in? I'll let you go first, Natalie. Sure. So I'm currently in Ames, Iowa, but I am hopefully moving to Indiana soon. We'll see what happens. But I'm originally from Jordan, lived in Qatar most of my life. So I went for, to school there. Then I moved to the U.S. for university and I'm still here for grad school. So I did my undergrad, my bachelor's degree in nutritional science and dietetics, and I minored in Russian studies. And currently I'm pursuing my master's of science in healthcare management at Indiana University, Bloomington. Yeah. Oh, I'm also a registered dietitian. There we go. I recently yeah. passed the exam. You may <laughs> throw, throw the qualifications <laughs> out. Throw that over my head. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Oh um, yeah, uh, recently I passed my exam, what, November? Um, same time around Nate, and so far I haven't found like my proper niche yet, but you know, I'm exploring everything and with my healthcare management, I'm really into the managerial side of dietetics and I really enjoy anything nutrition so far, but it's just it, new RD, exploring different things. Yeah, you have to find what you like and what, what you're good at as well. To mm-hmm. Nathan to, to take it away. Yeah, yeah. So I, I typically so I specialize in in fat loss and getting clients to their weight loss goal and then giving them sustainable methods to keep it off in theory forever. But how I got into the industry was I remember back in oh man, it was I graduated Iowa State 2015, went off and did some other things for a while and then decided to finally I didn't get an internship. Uh, did some other things for a while and did like grocery store management and found out like that wasn't who I was. And then I was like, Hey, I'm going to go do the next best thing. I'll be a personal trainer. Yeah. And so I went, I went off and uh, I had a, I went off and did some personal training. And then long story short about that, I had a client when they, they all, my gym requires to tell, tell them our qualifications were an A certified personal trainer. And everyone found out, Oh, I got a degree in dietetics. Apparently I didn't know so many people knew that meant nutrition. And so when I told them I did nutrition, of course, you know, you just open up the can of worms for um, nutrition questions. And at my gym, if you're not a dietitian, you can't really give any nutritional information other than this is my plate, this is fruit, this is vegetable. So there was I very limited information that I could give. And after so many people asking me questions on how on nutrition and uh, felt like I was dancing the line a lot of the times, I had my family call me up like, hey, go back and get your RD credentials. Like, ah, no one's going to take me. I've been out of the game for I think at that time it was like four years. And then I had a client call me out and she's like, you know, and she's like, why don't you go back and get us? Like, they're never going to accept me. I'm, and she's like, no, you're good. And then I had a, a girlfriend at the time. She called me out. So I was like, okay, if everybody's calling me out, I, mu- I obviously need to just go back and do it. So I finally just decided to, to get a read of my limiting beliefs and go back and uh, just go back and apply for the internship. And that's how Natalie and I actually got connected together. Her and I took the uh, same class in 2019, I believe. Um, and, and then, yeah, and we both ended up getting the internship. We actually did the same same uh, internship rotations. And then I ended up getting my RD credential. And then I decided that, hey, you know, I want to coach, coach clients online and work with them in person. And so that's kind of, I've started my online business as of officially uh, January of this year. I just saw that there was a need uh, just for more dietitians out in the space to just give really good, credible nutritional information and showing people that fat loss doesn't have to be as complicated and as hard. And you don't have to follow all these like fit teas that you diet. You don't have to follow all these crazy diet trends to lose weight. And I really just saw a need, like, you know, so many people can lose weight so rapidly, but I just didn't see very many people in the industry that were teaching people a system and a skills and a tool set when they're done working with my, when they're done working with these um, coaches to keep it off forever. I mean, you, you, I, you and you've probably seen it too there, uh, Nate, that people get done working with coaches and then they just fall off the bandwagon because those coaches um, fail to give them a system and structures and tools. They need to do this forever for whatever reason, from what I've been told, 
you know, it's because they like, I don't ever want the client to leave me. And it's like, I think that's such a wrong way of going about it. I, I found that when you all open it up for all the clients be like, yeah, my goal is to not work with you forever. They end up staying with you forever. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what, what, I just recently did a podcast on here for maybe two or three weeks ago. I was like, the goal of autonomy is uh, of my company is to kick you out. Like it's a poor, poor business model, but it makes me feel great. You know? And like, and I think that helps massively. Uh, and obviously then it gives all the client their autonomy to be able to make those right decisions. Um, just talking about that type of stuff, like Natalie, what do you see in terms of longevity of like health and, and wellness of like people when they lose weight, what type of like, I, I don't know, I don't want maybe call them habits. Do you see these people that have these longer term strategies? What type of habits do you see these people have uh, that are successful? Yeah, that's a really good question. So first of all, like to maintain that long term, you know, you've lost the weight, you want to maintain it long time. I feel that those people that maintain that weight, they follow a sustainable diet, as Nate said. They don't go switching diets every single day, going from keto to, I don't know, like a detox. No, this is just very sustainable methods of dieting or just, you know, being healthy overall. Um, second thing, just regular physical activity. We're not saying going hardcore at the gym, you know, just being physically active, um, going out for walks, exercising that 150 minutes a week, just getting that um, helps maintain that health overall long term. Yeah. What, what do you think consists of that? So you mentioned about a healthy diet or like a sustainable diet. What do you think? What, what do you recommend that consists of? That's a good question. So for everyone, it's kind of different. But in general, when I say like a healthy diet, it's well balanced, you know, you're not having your it's more like in moderation, you're not having too much or too little of something. We don't like to restrict foods. So uh, one thing like I tell everyone, like, you know, it's okay to have like that piece of cake, but don't have it every single day, like a whole slice. I mean, still have it, but in moderation. Um, and that goes with any single, any other meal um, that I recommend, honestly, just, you know, just try to have something balanced, a balanced meal. So basically, if you look at your plate here in the US, we have the my plate method. So it has to be like half of your plate is veggies and you got some proteins and your carbs and then your dairy. So, yeah, that's good. I, I think a lot of people will they look at moderation as, as either a thing that is either way too difficult for them to even consider or it's actually not favorable in their eyes. A lot of people have those associations with food where um, they get, to, I, I'm definitely with the Asian population that I work with, is that they, they fill their bellies and that's what makes them feel like it was a great meal as opposed to the food and the saturation of it and how it tastes and how it made you feel when you're eating it as opposed to chasing that feeling of like complete fullness. And that, that often takes away that element of moderation that anyone can actually have because they're they're eating past their capabilities of what the body's trying to tell them because they're not really listening. Um, yeah. Nathan, like, how do you get your clients to, you know, act in moderation uh, in the best way possible without it seeming like there's, you know, this rigid boundaries, which there will be boundaries at some point, but like, how do you get your client to do that? Yeah. And so the, I, and this is what I, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this. And I've actually had some dietitians reach out to me and tell me that like, I don't understand why you do it this way. This is a dumb way of doing it. And, well, my biggest thing is like, and I'm just going to give you a caloric number just as an example. So all my clients, I teach them to track their intake. And then I will take that tracking device away. Cause I mean, let's be honest, nobody other than myself and some really, you know, other um, weird individuals just love the idea of tracking their intake for life. But what I always tell people is I really don't care from the get-go what you eat because the way I look at it is if you have to hit, let's say, 2,000 calories and you don't even understand how to comprehend to hit that target, then what good does it do to be like, oh, yeah, like eat more of this, eat more of that. And the client never really ever feels like they're winning because you're like eat more fruits and vegetables and eat more of this. It's like, well, why don't we just figure out how to get you just to A, winning for starting, I just tell them track your intake. I don't really care how much you eat. I tell my clients, like, I don't care. I need to understand where you are. Because like, if I'm like, if I find out that this client needs 2,500 calories to lose, to lose weight, and they're eating 45, there is a snowball chance in hell that I'm going to be like, oh yeah, by the way, uh, I'm going to reduce your caloric intake by, I think that's like 2000 calories or whatever, however much that is. Because they're going to look at me and be like, they're going to fire me. They're like, no, because your body is not designed to make these hard stops. 
So I always tell clients that like, hey, your first win is that A, you showed up to my session and then B, you're just tracking your intake. I'm a firm believer that we can optimize late. We can optimize once I got you to hit the target. It's like, you know, like we got to work you into it. So like, okay, you've reached, you've tracked your intake. Now let me teach you how to get to, you know, let's say 3000 calories if you need, if that's what you need. Okay, cool. Now that you reach the thousand calories and now you need 2,500, let me stair step you down. And so each week they feel like they're winning because they come to the session. They're like, oh yeah, I reached it. But I don't put, and I always tell them, I don't put a lot of stock in the scale and it's people are like, well, but you do weight loss. I was like, yeah, but any guy on the internet can get you to lose weight. But what makes me different is I'm like, okay, cool. Like this is going to take longer than any Joe Schmo or anybody on the internet um, that's selling you fit tea and these fad diets. But what I'm going to do is we're going to go a little bit slower, but you're going to keep this off in theory forever because we're going to be developing the behavioral skills that you need to do this for life. Because it's not, because I think we get so focused on the outcome goal, right? I want to lose a hundred pounds or whatever, but it's like, did you, I feel like people forget like the behaviorals that you need to do to get there. And even though you may not produce loss on the scale the first month or two with me, but look at the behavioral goals that you're working towards. Look at all the skills you're doing. Because I always tell clients, if you take your time to do that, when we finally get to your weight loss phase, it literally comes off like butter. And they're like, this is cheating. I was like, now I always tell them, you see why we took that time? Because I want, because A, we need our clients to buy in, right? Like they're not going to buy in if they don't feel like they're winning. And I always tell people too, is there's way too much um, out there of clients already being feeling like that they're failed. Why should me, why should them working with me? Why should they show up to the session every single weekend? Why should I be a source of failure? I want to be the source of success. Cause I always tell my clients, regardless of how bad you think your week is, I can, there's def, there's going to be a win somewhere. And I tell clients, sometimes your win is you're just showing up and we're just taking the failure maybe. And we're using this feedback, like, okay, cool. So like, you're telling me that like, maybe this isn't working or you need more education here. So I'm really just getting the client. I'm, ta- I'm going with the clients at and giving them the information they need to take them that next step. Now to full circle answer your question is it's all about the psychology behind like why I always ask the question, why are you cleaning your plate? Why do you feel like you need to eat all of your food? And they're like, well, that, cause that's how, what I've always been taught. Because I mean, if you think about it, our generation here, um, I think anybody that's 25 or older can attest like I don't know my family was my family was like no you gotta eat everything like if you want that dessert you better eat the whole, everything and so we've been taught and our psych and our psychology has been taught that if you if you eat all of you're rewarded right by if you eat all your food you're gonna get the cake or whatever so we've been programmed to do that and it's a very hard concept for clients to understand that like it's okay not to eat everything to stop when you're full and that for some people can take a long time and I always tell my clients too is like how I always tell like, how long have you been doing this? You've probably been doing this for the last 10 to 15 years. So for you to think that I'm going to be able to reverse that effect in, in a month, just might not be feasible uh, because you got to learn, you got to be aware of, of what it is. Most clients don't even understand like, Oh, I didn't even realize that. Or when they go to family get togethers, I don't know about you, but I've been guilty of this. I think Natalie might be too. You're talking to somebody and there's insert whatever foods on the table. You may not be hungry, but you're going to eat it because the person in front of you is eating it. It's a social gathering. And next thing you know, you've ate an extra five, 600 calories. You didn't even know it. You're like, I don't understand why I can't lose weight. Well, it's because of mindless eating. So it's, I think it's just all the asking questions of you got to reprogram them to understand that it's okay not to eat everything because we've been programmed. Exactly. I really like that point. We know when you're saying like, listen to your cues, basically listen to your hunger cues, know when you're hungry. And Nate's approach is very like, as he said, behavioral change. So it programs them to like, start listening more to their body and what their body needs. And I think that's one step to becoming into a long-term sustainable health. Yeah, 100%. Like I'm like a secret fatty over here. So I'm going to see, speak for all the people that are screaming at the uh, the podcast going, you know, well, what about wasting food? And uh, what about all the, the things that people say, right? This is like, you know, um, wasting food and you get not getting your money's worth. And these are all like limiting beliefs that we're all being told to kind of reprogram. It's the same as, I don't know if it's the same in America, but like, if you're if you're mid 20s you're expected or this unwritten rule is like you you get a relationship you move out you get a house you get a car you get a dog you get a family you get a, you live up this like uh, louder and for a lot of people that isn't actually the, the right way of going around it. it's just the way that it's pre-programmed 
um, to be set because that's what other people are doing around you because they're listening to their parents who did that. And it's a cycle again. It's the same as these type of unwritten rules. And as I get further in my 20s, I'm, I'm realizing there's a lot more than what I thought there was. Um, and the, the whole thing of just being able to be comfortable with half your plate just sitting there because inside you is telling you, actually, you don't need any more, Nath. It's like, it's okay. Um, but it, it, half of you is also going, Oh, but like you should finish it like you know you don't you want to get your money's worth or you're paying for that or um you know or what it's going to go to waste so these are fundamental flaw it's fundamental flaws in like short-term dieting is that they don't address these things um I, but i also don't know if you can do them all of the time in the dieting phase because a lot of things have to go on especially with the clients at different points let's say for example if you've got a short time frame for a transformation which is absolutely fine and maybe you do that but there is going to be periods afterwards where you do work on that um, it, it, the awareness around it's awareness around food, mindfulness, uh, honoring your body signals, and being able to do those fundamental things. Once you can get accustomed to that, and I'm a big, I watch people, and I'm a big like people watcher. So like you see a 50 kilo female who who's 50, they're, 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 their food choices, if they've looked at the 50 kilos for the last 20 years, their food choices and the way that they eat will be significantly different to the 100 kilo person sitting next to them and how they interact and how they act and what they eat and how they eat it and you know how many chews that they take and if they're putting the knife and fork down every single time, what they're focusing on during the dinner, all of these things make a massive difference. And if you're looking at the next 50 years of your life, these things become ever more present if you are saying I want to stay in shape long term without having to do multiple diets and multiple fat loss phases because you're you're always yo-yoing between that yeah. so like yeah. that's it's a really really good point so so do, um, do, when you when you do those like fat loss phases how do you how do you get clients to I guess buy into let's say they're new completely new gem pop completely new haven't haven't lifted the dumbbell in their life like what's your order of priority so you're you've got everything under the sun to try and focus on these in, these individuals are not particularly uh well endowed with knowledge or they're not well endowed with any type of genetic um influences how do you what's the first step to change nally so that's something i think uh, nate has more experience on with his <laughs> clients <laughs> If you want to get a shot at that one, Nate. Yeah, yeah. So here's what I do. And I, I take, uh, and, and, and Natalie gets credit for, for this. So I call it the Seth approach. It's simple, it's effective and fun. So she, Natalie actually gets credit for coming up with the acronym and telling me <laughs> actually to say it. And then, cause she, cause she told me one day, she's like, well, why don't you just put these letters together? And I was like, okay, when I'm a millionaire, I'm going to give you some of it. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I look at, when I look at the hierarchy, right, when I look at a client that comes to me, one of the biggest things I found from being a personal trainer, and I'm a, I'm a big component of really, really, and I'm not really good dietitians are also, were also personal trainers or did some sort of weight training because they understand progressions better. I can tell if a dietitian, and, and I don't mean to hit on my profession because I'm not, I can tell if a dietitian has never worked out in their life because they don't understand like, okay, what comes next? Like we all look at like a squat progression, right? You go you know, you go body weight squat, you go front squat, you go dumbbell squat, then you go back squat and you do all these progressions. So how I look at the hierarchy is I always tell, I always focus on nutrition first because that, cause it's my nutrition coaching program. That's what I'm selling them first is I have, you either pick one or the other. And for me, I start with nutrition. Um, and what I do is again, it comes down to my first phase is the awareness and getting to know you phase in phase one. And that's like, I'm just trying to figure out, I got to figure out where you're at. I spend a month and people look at me like, why do you spend so long here? I'm like, well, because some clients, it literally takes me an, a month to get the root cause, regardless of how well the questions are formulated to get the root cause out of them. Because um, I actually had a girl, I had a gal I've worked with and um, it took me forever to get her to make the link that it was her stress that was causing her to not be able to lose weight had nothing to do with it. She wasn't able to track her intake. It just, she's stressing. And so through all these strategies and trying to figure out how to get her to understand that, like when you're stressed, this is why, this is where the extra thousand calories are coming from. And then once we figured that out, we were able to rock and roll. So I always look at the hierarchy of what is the, what's the lowest hanging fruit of that client. If a client comes to me on my biofeedback scale and says their stress is a five out of five, nutrition gets completely thrown out the window. I don't even, I don't even consider nutrition because the way I look at it is if they're super stressed, they're going to stress. See, I need to come up with anchors. I need to figure out, okay, what can I replace? What 
a bad habit are you doing that's causing you to not lose weight? Are you staying up too late? Is your sleep completely out of whack? So I'm looking at the whole big picture of what the actual issues are based upon my biofeedback scale and where are they at? And stress is usually my first indicator. Okay, why are they stressed? And nine times out of 10 for the clients I've worked with, that's the reason that they can't lose the weight that they want is because they're, they're stressed to the max and they're eating on the go. And they, they, so I have to under, I have to give them these anchors. And then once I give them the anchors, then I'm like, okay, now let's track your intake. Behavioral modifications have to come first. Tracking your intake and doing all and tracking your protein intake and doing all this other stuff, measuring your food and doing all that doesn't even come into the equation until we've got to the actual the work cause of the problem. And nine, and most of the clients that I've worked with, the work cause of the problem is stress. And, and I had one person that literally the, their issue was that they just drank too much pop. So we had to come up with skills and tools to reduce the pop consumption first before we could do even anything, or maybe they have a food phobia. And then I have to ask questions and make sure it's not an eating disorder. So I, or if I have to refer out, that's what I look for. Um, so there's a lot of things that I try to take, to take into the equation before I'm like, okay, we're going to start here. But typically I get my, if we look at the hierarchy, very simple, it's root cause of the problem, track their calories, track their protein. And then we, and then I give them caloric intakes based upon what they need to reach their weight loss goal. And then we work through behavioral modifications and skills and strategies as we go through. And then month three or four, depending on how they're progressing, then I'm going to start adding exercise into their routine, like actual, a structured exercise program, like you're going to go to the gym two to three times a week or whatever. I'm really trying to take all these lifestyles, their lifestyle into account and figure out where can I fit things so they can do it long term. So that's kind of, that's how I do it. And I used to do it where I was like, oh yeah, we're going to do your nutrition. We're going to do training. And then I found out that if you do more than one habit at a time, you have a 33% chance of actually being compliant. So I was like, well, okay, well, let's just, let's just not do that. Let's just focus on one thing at a time, get quick wins build the buy-in and then just go from there. I actually have a nutritional periodization chart that I map out. I take their outcome goal and then I map out what a three month uh, blueprint looks like. And then I modify it accordingly. Like, okay, here's your goal for month one. Here's your goal for month two. Here's your goal for month three. What are week one and two behaviors that you need? And then what are week three and four behaviors you need? And they skill stack on top of each other. That's interesting. Step by step. Not to not to give you a very loaded question, not to give you a very loaded answer, but I just think there's just so many components that we have to take into account. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fair. Um, and I think that that's absolutely necessary. I think there's never, I don't know if there's, there's ever going to be ever approach where you can just instantly plug in and pop in the, all of the habits and behaviors and everything we need in one go. Um, and, and a lot of people will have their I guess they're their ways of doing things, periodizations, they'll have their phases, the journey that people go on, and it'll all hopefully comprise of these things, hopefully, as the industry does evolve to not be just a piece of shit uh, and ends up being something pretty decent, uh, hopefully in the, long, in the longer term. Um, but outside of that, so that's some fantastic information uh, from, a, from a nutritional perspective and, and people wanting to start the journey. Now, I'm really curious about you guys, you guys specifically. It's always about the people behind uh, the methods that they have. So like, Natalie, you got a fantastic resume. Just also looked on it on the internet just now while you whilst uh, Nathan was speaking um, on on your um, the Iowa site of um, I think the University of Iowa. They've got a lot of stuff about you uh, and the, the the spotlights that they got you as a uh, as a student. Um, what are you yeah. curious about right now that's going to help in the future for your your own service, your own st- stuff? You know, that's a really great question. Um, <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, I got some fame on Google. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> um, for me, well, right now, you know, the reason I'm pursuing a master's in healthcare management is just not, you know, I want to be a leader in our field in nutrition. I feel like it's necessary to have, we need a voice for all these health um, health professionals, the dietitians. We need those because right now we're in this, we're, we're in an industry where like a lot of the people, like, for example, celebrities, you know, just a small example, are winning us over and selling things that are not real, like those simple things like such as detox diets and those like bizarre pills that don't necessarily work. And I, what I'm doing, what my goal is, you know, I want to strive for that, like, you know, strive for policy change. I want something not 
just us professionals trying to tackle this, but we need someone from the above to try and tackle this problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it needs to start also at the top. When we get the top people trying to control of this, I feel like, you know, overall, we're going to have a healthier world <laughs> in general. So really, that's my goal, you know, just to be a leader um, and, it, you know, not just in the nutrition space, but in the healthcare space in general. So hopefully after I graduate, um, I hope to be, you know, working in hospital, looking at um, as a health administrator job or going into my PhD. I haven't decided yet. Like I'm still like kind of deciding, but I still want to build, you know, my skills and uh, management and just and all those like policy and policy work and see how I can try and change uh, what's going on right now yeah. in our field. Yeah, you're not you're not wrong about that. Top down or it will it it should it, it should it should come from both ways, top down and the bottom up as well, because we're all just trying to do our best for the individuals who's stuck in that mid ground, right? Um, <laughs> here's probably the, the million dollar question: Why is it important to you that you do this? Like, where does that drive from? Uh, you know, where's that stemmed from? Like, what's been your experiences that have led to this position where you're like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm gonna I'm gonna change this. Right. Uh, so. <laughs> that's a very good question so um in my undergrad you know I, I wanted to go to med school at first I was like I want to help save lives I want to be a doctor but then uh, overall I started taking nutrition courses and I really fell in love with like the nutrition world but I saw how much I don't want to say maybe maybe some discrimination you know where we were going to listen to the doctor first dietitian second um there that has been a common problem you know it's just like well the doctor told me this well you know we've studied nutrition for six years and I know Nate he's like mm -hmm, yep so you know <laughs> we, we, we do our, we do one of the hardest national exams we undergo six years of education for you to tell me no the doctor has a like has a better uh, nutrition opinion than you um please no <laughs> that's not always the case right so I just trying to that was kind of like frustrating in a way I'm like I felt offended many times and then another thing you know I participated a lot in uh, extracurricular activities um, being very involved in the university and clubs and I just love the whole like leadership aspect and you know I like to say I like to you know say how how things should go or you know be a leader help foster a better environment overall you know I want to create a team where you know not just me telling people what to do but I want to teach others um, to help others in the future also uh, telling them like how to be better individuals overall and how to do their work better so really that's just like how everything stemmed and then one interesting thing happened in my dietetic internship I, I attended uh legislative day here in the U.S. So basically where dietitians and like interns and students like us, we basically go to uh, senators, I believe, and we go like, okay, we want a policy change, for example. We want to improve reimbursement services for dietitians. Um, we, want, uh, we want more funding for a nutrition program here in the state or something. We try to uh, talk to them so that hopefully it reaches Congress at some point where we can see those changes happen in a statewide um in, in statewide basically so that really interested me so i talked to dietitians and i said well what's the biggest problem right now in our healthcare and they said like literally we need our voices heard we need more of people you know just telling telling everyone as i said the top ones what's going on right now and and helping uh helping us like change everything that's going on um, with everything that's happening so really just those different experiences has helped me uh, be where I am today and what I want to do in the future another thing that also like really sparked my interest was the whole again reimbursements for dietitians like you know as an intern people do not want to seek nutrition advice at a hospital they don't want to come and get treated for obesity for example just because they're not covered by insurance and it's expensive to be treated for these things, you know? And if we have, you know, better services in general, I feel like it will encourage people to build a healthier lifestyle than looking at the cheaper options. It's always, 
there's a lot of uh, problems right now where everything is so expensive to be treated that it shouldn't be that way. Yeah, we like we we have obviously a completely we're well, not completely different experience over here uh one completely agree uh, with the whole uh, doctors and then the hierarchy of where we sit because well, not we sit but you guys sit as and we do as well because uh, we mm -hmm. often say i've got a team of coaches and i always say to them like if your client is talking to a physio about their exercises uh, and like saying like they were going to do the whatever rehab rehab and I've done a rehab degree like I know my stuff when it comes to that type of stuff to a really high level uh, and then they get give them that poor advice I always say never argue with the with the person that's getting the physio advice because they're in a hierarchy above you and it's the same with uh, doctors over here in the UK is that they're called general practitioners for a reason because they're general practitioners that'll one person for 15 minutes will be talking about how to get a contraceptive pill. And then the next minute they'll be dealing with someone with high cholesterol. And the next minute after that, they'll be dealing with someone who's on blood thinners and that they have to cover all those vast, uh, vast areas. But the reason why we study what we study in one specific niche is to go an inch thick or an inch wide and a mile deep. Uh, and, and it's those people that need that. I guess it's that step change to think this is the industry that needs that type of you go and see this person because they've got that depth of knowledge as opposed to just the criteria that it is at the moment where it's like there's a doctor that sits on top of it even if it's something that they don't know nothing about and normally like I've trained doctors before most of them don't know the rasp between an elbow between a protein and a carb uh, like and, and they're the worst ones because they also think that they know it because they did it in med school but then they didn't do it in med school they covered the basics enough to help understand what red flags are so that they could take them off and refer them to someone else, not understand the actual information. So totally, totally agree on that one. It's one of my chosen subjects to really bash for a, a long time. I could do that forever. Um, so, so I'm going to move off that very, very quickly. But um, what you said about the, the need for help with individuals who have to pay for it with their own healthcare in, in the US, you know, it's, it's not quite similar here. I mean, we have funds for specific things like, you know, Weight Watchers, you know, the GPs can refer them to that and they will get free services for that. But at the same time, is, uh, it, it's always a beautiful thing when people get referred to something, if it's have a really, really highly uh, monetized, so it's, it's money taken from their back pocket, or it's something that they're really just pushed towards because they feel that this is what they have to do to either get the meds that they needed or that's the next thing on their thing. They're never really going to do it. It's always a really hard thing where it's the push comes to shove. When someone's forced into a corner or they're forced down a funnel, which they don't want to go down, they're never going to get that level of buy-in that Nathan was speaking about before, even when they were looking at nutritional habits, because they're already deaf when you're talking to them, because they just either have to just show up for that meeting because they got told to by their doctor, or it's it's just something that they don't want to do, but they have to do. So mm. I, I, I don't have an absolute scooby-doo what the alternative is, but I know that there needs to be one. Um, and that, that's where, you, that's where you know, you, you, you'll be coming in uh, as, as you do that. But it's just very interesting to hear those things because you know, getting treated, I can't imagine what it feels like to get treated for obesity in a hospital when it's, they're not really considered, in the UK anyway, I'm not, I don't consider, or like, sorry, I, I do, but people who are obese don't consider obesity to be something that you would go to a hospital for. You would think they just need to eat less food and they probably already know that themselves anyway. I, I, I wouldn't know, imagine, or the feeling that people have to go to, to go to a hospital to get treated for that. Um, and I can't, that, that would be very demoralizing, I feel, and it would be a pretty high dropout rate as well. <laughs> Um, well, it's, it's funny that you say that because one of the biggest things that just here and it this just drives me freaking bonkers is and i'm gonna get a lot of flack for this but bariatric clinics just piss me off and and the, and the reason for it and i'm not saying that like it's not effective because it is effective short term i have seen way too many clients not my personal clients I've seen way too many people that yeah cool they're like oh well, i need to lose like 80 pounds so I can go on a rate on this, have this surgery. And I'm like, okay, well, did your doctor ever ask the question of if you can lose 80 pounds without the surgery, do you still even need the surgery? And I'm not saying that weight loss surgery should be eradicated because that's not what I'm saying, but I'm just like, why don't we ask the sophisticated question of if the client can already lose 80 pounds and the client has 80 pounds left to go, why do we need to half their stomach? Or why do we need to do these, these in-depth procedures? Now, Natalie's going to have a little bit more insight than I do because I'm not seeing that. But it's like, if we're giving this education to do it, if you can lose 80 pounds, you, if you can lose 20, 30, 40 pounds, it just scales. 
And I think the other problem that we see in the medical field, and this is just from my personal experience, and Natalie, please correct me if I am incorrect here, is when you look at a dietitian, I remember doing diet edu education, we are taught one and done sessions. The client is never taught or is never sold this long-term journey of these sustainable skills. It's like, okay, you've, you, we've got to do all these things. It's like, well, you just, this client just got diabetes. And now you've got a doctor telling them not to eat carbohydrates. They got a dietitian that's telling them that they can't have carbohydrates. And now you're having their best friend's mom telling them that like carbs are going to kill them. And it's like they they left the they left the medical they left the office with a doctor telling them carbs are evil and a dietitian, and they're like, I don't know what the hell to do. So you know what I'm going to do? Screw it. I'm just going to I don't I don't give two craps. And that's I think the problem is our dot is dietitians, and this is where I call out my academy, and this is why I love Natalie's going into policy. I do not have the patience for that, nor do I have the personality, because I'm one of those people that like, if I believe in something, I'm going to sink the ship or write it. So I don't have the personality to talk with people up there. So I really appreciate Natalie doing that. But it's like you overwhelm the client. Our education has taught us to overwhelm the client. It's like, well, of course, diet, it doesn't work. And then you talk to dietitians and they're like, well, this is how we've always done it. It's like, well, how have you done this for the last 20 years and never sat and asked the question, why isn't this working? Yeah. What do we need to change? And it's not necessarily completely the dietitian's fault. It comes right down to what Natalie said is policies. And it's like, you really think that you're going to have a client that's a hundred pounds overweight. You really, or diabetes. Do you really think you can do that in three sessions? Absolutely not. And one so, thing in the healthcare space, oh, sorry, I didn't interrupt. Go ahead. Nate. No, no, continue. go ahead there, Natalie. Oh, I'm like, one of the things, we have less than a minute, but you know, patient visits. I was just about to say, let me uh, let me restart it because this is a very interesting conversation. I don't want it to go sure. off halfway through, so let me pause it. <laughs>